welcome to lesson number 3 of the course on industrial automation and control. So, in this course, in this lesson we are going to start at level 0 of the automation pyramid and in particular we are going to look at measurement systems or sensors. So, before we are going to do, we are going to look at this measurement system for a few lectures to come. So, before we do that, let us first look at a general measurement systems and try to understand its characteristics. So, that is precisely what we are going to do today. So, in this lesson we are going to look at measurement systems characteristics and the and the instructional objectives are the following. First of all, the most important thing is to learn is the what is known as the static <coughs> characteristics of sensors and instruments and then the understand what is meant by calibration and what do we how do we characterize errors describe the response of first and second order sensors to dynamic inputs that is most important for control and finally interpret look at some industrial sensor specifications so let's first look at the general structure of a measurement system so all measurement systems <coughs> can be thought of uh, being made up of you know one or more of these blocks so here is the uh, <coughs> so here we have the actual measure end whatever signal we are trying to measure pressure temperature <coughs> that is the signal which is affecting the sensing element so there is a sensing element actually sensing is a is a process of continuous energy conversion from one form from any form depending on what we are trying to measure so from mechanical form or from thermal form or from optical form to finally to an electrical form <coughs> and then the electrical form gets finally transmit uh, transformed further to you know digital forms etc before they are output so through these blocks that conversion takes place so here you have the measure end or the input which is the true value so the real pressure or the real temperature which is the sensing element which exists at the sensing element <coughs> then the sensing element does the first round of conversion and brings it generally to some sort of an electrical form either in the form of electrical parameters like resistance capacitance changes or in the form of voltages and currents which have to be further manipulated by electrical circuits called signal conditioning elements and sometimes you know I mean amplified sometimes the conversion from resistance to voltage. So, at generally at this level it is in a standard electrical form of voltage but then some further signal processing goes on to remove noise to make it linear and things like that some of it can be analog some of it can be digital and then finally it goes to the data presentation element or where the data is utilized it can be presentation or application element so it can be a display or it can be a recorder or it can be a controller so this is the general structure of a measurement system <coughs> For example, if you take an example, <coughs> for example, here is a weight measurement system. So, the input is the true weight, which is sensed by a mechanical member called the load cell, which converts it to strain. That is sensed by a <coughs> by another member called a strain gauge. We will we will see all these all these sensors in our future lessons which converts it to a resistance form. So, you have you see that even there are two sensing elements the first sensing element converts weight to strain the next one converts strain to resistance and then we feed it to an electrical circuit called the Wheatstone's bridge which converts this resistance change to a low level voltage millivolts. <coughs> so, this is the so these are you know signal conditioning elements then it goes to an amplifier which amplifies it to you know standard voltage ranges like 0 to 10 volts then it goes to if we, we, we most often it is very convenient to have digital signal processing so we can make, go, make it through an eddy converter then input it into maybe some microcomputer and do some digital signal processing and then finally send it to a in this case a display so you get a digital display 
of the reading along with units right. So, that is some more data processing. So, this is how uh, real measurement systems looks like. So, you, it has it is basically a cascade of several blocks including the sensor, the signal conditioner plus some computing elements like the signal processor. <coughs> So, sensing is actually extremely important in automation from various points of view. Firstly, in product quality control because the product quality is actually assessed by <coughs> sensors themselves by some sort of instruments. In process control, so if you have a rolling mill and if you want to control the roll thickness, then the then you have feedback or, or all most of pro, all process control is actually you know a uh, closed loop feedback control about which we are going to learn in the future lessons. So, for that a critical element is the feedback element. So, <coughs> the variable which is being controlled it may be thickness, it may be temperature whatever has to be continuously fed back using a sensor in the uh, sensor of the control system and the performance of the control system is actually critical to that of this to the sensor. So, sensing is of primary importance in control. Then process monitoring and supervision. So, you know all kinds of you know coordination between machines, then uh, fault detection, safety measures, all this can be done plus providing you know energy efficient optimal set points. For doing all this we need sensors <coughs> and finally, we also need sensors for you know manufacturing automation. So, uh, as we will see when we will when, when we will see how the uh, manufacturing automation systems can be put together using uh, using let us say programmable logic controllers, then you will find that they use various kinds of sensors extensively you know sensors like you know uh, limit switches, uh, pressure switches, contacts etcetera. So, <coughs> so sensing is extremely important in, in automation. Now, so in this lesson we are going to see that if you if you if you look at a sensor as an as an as an abstract element which gives you a which gives you a value which gives you the information about a physical quantity then we need to know how to characterize the behavior of this device called the sensor or the instrument so we need to understand about instrument characteristics and instrument characteristics can be of two types <coughs> The first is the static characteristics. Static characteristics implies that uh, <coughs> of an instrument are concerned only with steady state readings. So, if you uh, <coughs> it says that if you apply a 1 volt signal do you get a 2 volt signal. So, we are not we are just saying that if we apply let us say we to a to a temperature sensor if we apply 100 degree centigrade what is the output voltage. Now, we are not concerned with with the fact when we are discussing static characteristic is that how this how the temperature came from whatever was let us say the room temperature 200 degree centigrade how much time it took what was exactly the way the voltage rose we are not asking about these things we just want to know that if you apply 100 degree centigrade eventually the temperature settles at what value. So, so you know that would be a static characteristics. Now, <coughs> static characteristics are important for indicating instruments because indicating instruments are generally concerned with uh, with uh, steady state values uh, or for or where or for instruments where the dynamics is actually very fast that is this settling from whatever was the temperature to the 100 degree centigrade temperature is so fast that are, that for all practical purposes we can neglect the way the temperature rose that's that 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 does not concern us so in such cases the static characteristics is of importance while there are cases where dynamic characteristics is also important especially in control because uh, as we shall see later that the performances of control loops for example, when you are trying to control the the essence of feedback control is that suppose you are saying that this temperature should be maintained at 100 degree centigrade. Now, if the temperature sensor has a 2 degree centigrade error by which I mean that suppose when the temperature is 90 degree 98 degree centigrade the 
sensor is telling you that it is 100 degree centigrade. It is giving you a wrong information by which is wrong by 2 degrees. Then the controller has no way of knowing the actual temperature 98. It actually thinks that it is 100 degree centigrade and it tries to maintain it at that, that temperature while the actual temperature stays at 98 degree centigrade. So, you have a steady state error right. So, you have a real error that is that physical real temperature will be 98 while the controller will think that is 100. So, such errors occur due to uh, due to controllers and uh, <coughs> due to errors in sensors number one and number two is that now these errors can sometimes be be reduced by you know designing the gains. So, it sometimes happens that we need to not only maintain fixed temperature sometimes we need to track temperatures. So, in such a case if we do not get the, the readings as they are existing then, then what happens is that the temperature develops what is called a phase lag that is the controller develops a phase lag and it will not be possible to exactly track you know moving, moving uh, commands. So, in such cases dynamics of the sensors are actually important. So, we will look at both sensor and uh, both static and dynamic characteristics and before we look at this characteristic we need to understand how they are obtained. So, they are actually obtained by a process called calibration. So, basically a calibration is you know we are saying that <coughs> if the true value is so and so what is this. So, calibration is basically when you say static when you say characteristics of an instrument what you mean is what is the input output characteristic. So, if the true value is so and so what is the output that is what uh, that is what is essentially to be determined. Now, the point is that the true value can never be known. So, therefore, how do you assess the true how do you get the true value. So, essentially what we have to do is that we have to measure the true value again using some other instrument which for scientific and technical reasons we actually believe to be much more accurate. So, it is always calibration is, is essentially a, a, a comparison between the instrument that is being calibrated and another instrument which is assumed to be the true value. So, such instruments depending on the, the calibration situation for example, if you are calibrating if you are calibrating there is a there is actually a calibration chain in the sense that when you are calibrating some instrument in the factory it is not possible for for all variables there are some very very accurate instruments which are maintained in under special uh, conditions in you know you know national standards laboratories. But when somebody is calibrating let us say in a, in a shop floor it is not possible to possible that 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 every instrument will be calibrated against the national uh, standard. So, therefore, there are secondary and tertiary standard equipment. So, so anything will have to be <coughs> calibrated against such an instrument. So, that is what it says that with either a primary standard or a secondary standard with a higher accuracy than the instrument is to be calibrated. So, this is this is the essential scenario that you have a you have a you have a this is the sensor instrument which is to be calibrated. Now, the reading the you are first of all you are look at the fact that this is the measurement whose which you are measuring using some standard instrument and you are thinking that this is the true value. <coughs> this is an assumption you are also measuring uh, now th here this is not required I do not know why this is this is connected this diagram is wrong, drawn wrongly. So, the sensor instrument under calibration is giving a measurement. Now, this measurement uh, again for example, suppose it is a voltage then how many volts it is that again will have to be measured by some instrument. So, uh, so that may be this instrument right. So, in that sense this is required. So, it, so you have to you have to measure the measurement if, if the measurement is for example, given in, given in a digital form then you do not need to measure it then you can. So, so this may be there or not there. On the other hand there are you know this sensor this instrument reading or the measurement is actually a result of not only the measurement it is a result of many other factors for example, it, it, it may be a result of temperature. For example, if you take the if you take the weighing weight measurement case then the then the strain gauge 
resistance change is not only a function of the weight you put, it is also a function of the temperature because every resistance has some temperature coefficient. So, if the temperature varies, then the resistance is going to change. Similarly, there are various kinds of interfering inputs like for example, there may be some noise, there may be some, some noise induced from a, from a, from a power supply or, or, or from, some, from some power line or especially in the, in, the, in the industrial environment, there are plenty of noise sources and these sources, these signals can also affect the sensor measurements. So, generally when you to the extent possible, when you are trying to calibrate an instrument, you will have to also note what are the, for example, what is the temperature. So, if you, so, so that you can actually apply the corresponding corrections and, and you can characterize, when you are trying to characterize the instrument, you will also have to characterize its response with respect to these kind of inputs. I mean, in some cases, it may not be possible to measure these kind of in interfering inputs and in such cases, we try to ensure that these interfering inputs are not present. So, we do shielding, we actually do take it to a different, uh, different setting and actually try to, try to see what the sensor is doing. So, essentially, we try to measure the measurement, we, we try to sense, we try to also measure the output of the instrument and we try to measure modifying inputs like temperature. And then we establish the characteristics of the instrument. So, since the instrument must have been constructed to be you know relatively unaffected by, by, by modifying inputs. So, I mean generally what is, what is of much more importance of primary importance is to see how the instrument characteristics are dependent on the measure end right. So, that is what we are going to look at mainly now. So, uh, so this is what it says that this is what I was talking about that there are dif different standards of instruments. So, the instrument to be calibrated can be calibrated against a laboratory standard. Now, the laboratory standard instrument also has to be from time to time calibrated against you know other standards like you know secondary standards <coughs> which are which are which are which are special instruments which can be you know existing in some test houses and then so you from time to time we have to send these instruments to the test houses and get them calibrated. On the other hand, these test house instruments again have to be calibrated against in some very, very accurate national standards. So, so in this way you have you know what is a what is called a chain of standards of increasing accuracy and at different levels you always calibrate according to a uh, with respect to an instrument which is at the at the next level according to the chain. So, let us look at these static characteristics. So, we begin with span. So, So, it says that if in a measuring instrument the highest point of calibration is x 2 units and the lowest point is x 1 units. So, what we are trying to say is that the instrument is has been used between two points. So, the instrument has been calibrated to work between two points right and this is so, so, so this is x 2 and this is x 1 then the instrument range is x2 it is it, it is the highest so it can work up to that value and and the and the span is x2 minus x1 so if this is 200 degree centigrade and if this is minus 40 degree centigrade then the range is 200 and the span is 240 right so that's pretty obvious so we we have to remember these two details Next, let us talk about one of the most perhaps the most important parameter called accuracy. So, accuracy if you see instrument specifications, they will be they will be generally written as accurate to within x percent of either reading or span. You know, sometimes they say reading, sometimes they say span. In fact, sometimes they also mention constant values that is that is accurate within plus minus 1 degree centigrade. So, if when, when this constant value then since the span is a constant quantity, so you can always express it as a percentage of span also 
right. So, if the span is 100 degree centigrade, then a, an error is of plus minus 1 degree centigrade can be expressed as 1 percent of the span. So, <coughs> it is either a constant value, it may be expressed as a percent of span or it is a percent of the reading, okay. So, what it, it means that if, there, if, if a reading is 100 and if it has plus minus 1 percent of let us say uh, span accuracy, then the reading is somewhere within let us say 99 and then the true temperature will be between 99 and 101 degree centigrade. And this, so at all points, so whatever reading you get, you can always basically these are needed because the because the user of the instrument needs to know that in what within what values so it gets a reading but within what, what is the guarantee that the true value will be staying within certain limits so that limit is stated by accuracy but then again the the true value is unknowable and it is actually what what is stated is that with respect to the calibration so then the next point is linearity you know we generally want although instrument calibrations will not strictly follow a linear curve, but still it is very useful to, to imagine the, the system as a linear one. So, you know if you have a, so that you can very easily interpret the true value. So, if you have an instrument sensitivity of let us say 10 millivolts per, per degree centigrade, then if it gives a 25 millivolt signal then you know that it is that the, that the temperature is 2.5 degrees centigrade. So, you can get it just by dividing by a number or sometimes adding another number to it. So, it is, it is from that point of view, from the point of view usability, it is very attractive to express a div, the, the characteristic of the linear one, but then it is not linear. So, therefore, while you mention a line which can be, which can be used for deducing the true value from a reading you also have to give some bounds within which the, the true value will remain because it is not exactly going to because the instrument does not actually follow that line characteristics. The line is only an approximation. So, when you when you are telling the user to use the approximate model of the line for simplicity, you also have to tell him what is the kind of error that he or she can expect if she uses that uses the uh, linear model of the instrument. So, that is given by the measure of linearity. So, the linearity specification indicates the deviation of the calibration curve from a good fit straight line. So, now how do we how do we obtain this straight line? We can obtain the straight line e, e, in various ways. So, one way would be this that you actually perform some calibration experiments. So, you got these data points. So, you got these data points these are experimentally obtained. So, for all you know the, the true characteristic of the instrument, let, let me use a white color that will be good. So, for all you know the true characteristic of the instrument may be like this and you are approximating it by the straight line. So, you have to also say that while if you use the straight line characteristics, then, then the true value is going to be within which limit. So, that is why when you say linearity, actually the linearity specification is actually a non-linearity specification in the sense that it indicates deviation from linearity. So, it is defined as a maximum deviation of an output reading from a good fit straight line. So, obviously you want that, so obviously you want that the straight line that the, that the linearity specification is small. So, that you are telling that if you use that straight line characteristic, you are not going to have much error that is what you are telling to the user. So, so that it is the smallest possible you have to actually take all the data and make a make a make a best fit straight line such that the sum of square of errors is the least or something like that. So, that is that is linearity that it is the deviation of the calibration data from some good good straight line which you have obtained either by data fitting or in some cases it may be obtained also in a different way. So, for example, in this case you can also obtain it that that is a that is a simpler way by taking the reading at the least value and the maximum value and then simply assuming that the characteristic is going to be like this. Now, this is not the best fit line probably for this curve the best fit line would have been like this. However, in some 
in some cases you can perhaps use this line that 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 that's actually a simple thing if if it doesn't matter so basically nonlinearity whatever is the line once you have fixed the line the the nonlinearity is actually this deviation so here it has a maximum deviation so the nonlinearity spec or which is i mean some we actually refer it to as a linearity spec is actually deviation from that line right so next we are interested in sensitivity so sensitivity is actually the slope of the line so <coughs> if you have a calibration curve and then so that that will be the sensitivity and if you if you have a calibration curve and then get a get a get a straight line in case you you are you have a linear characteristic it will have one single sensitivity if it is very non linear then sometimes you may also express it as so you can take do actually do do various things you can express say let us say three sensitivity figures so one sensitivity figure will apply in this range the other sensitivity figure which is the which is the average slope of the line in this range and then another sensitivity figure which will apply in this range or you can so basically sensitivity is the slope of the characteristics so depending on the nonlinearity you have you can use multiple slopes on multiple ranges sometimes instruments do that similarly we are also interested in what is called repeatability or or you know precision in the sense that we want we don't want that today we 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 make a measurement of the temperature of boiling water so so it is giving me some some reading tomorrow if i take that reading should should be should be nearly same it may not be exactly same but it but it should be nearly same so when it is very close when you if you take multiple readings if they are very close then the then the instrument is said to be repeatable or or, or precise right so so uh so the, so repeatability of an instrument is the degree of closeness with which a measurable quantity may be repeatedly measured right so we go to the next one which is resolution this is also very it says that how much of change in input will actually cause a detectable change in the output so what is the smallest change in the input so if so can we detect a change of 0.1 degree centigrade or can we detect a change in 0 0.01 degree centigrade for example if you have a, a clinical thermometer then you cannot possibly detect a change of 0 0.01 degree centigrade or 0 0.01 degree fahrenheit generally they are calibrated in terms of fahrenheit so 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 that is the resolution if a temperature transistor is, is resolution is 0 0.2 degree centigrade then it is the smallest temperature change that can be observed okay similarly we have similar to the concept of dead zone sometimes you know sensors sensor systems will have dead zones for example we often find that you know these electrical meters sometimes they will stick you know any any mechanical arrangement tends to develop something like a static friction which also develop depends on many things like temperature time humidity and other things so what happens is that till the say if you have an ammeter then till you send a certain amount of current the torque is not enough to overcome static friction so the so the needle doesn't move so it is a so dead zone is the largest value of the measured variable for which the instrument output stays zero so from zero to that value there is going to be no deflection no reading nothing so that's called a dead zone so what's the difference between the dead zone and the resolution dead zone is the is is actually the the resolution from zero while resolution is can, resolution can be resolution from 24.24 to 24.1 24.1 to 24.2 while generally uh, dead zone is referred to from zero so it occurs due to factors such as static friction <coughs> similarly sometimes we have we have hysteresis in instruments so that if we have an increasing sequence of input values if we are increasing the input from let us say 0 10 degree centigrade 20 degree centigrade 30 degree centigrade they are increasing sequence of values then we get one set of readings 
while if we have a decreasing set of values then we get another set of readings and these readings are distinctly different right. So, in that case we, we say that the instrument has an has a hysteresis. It can occur due to various factors like you know gears, uh, gear backlash or it can occur due to you know magnetic components or sometimes by due to you know hysteresis which occurs due to elasticity. So, so due to such things the hysteresis can be there. So, what, what is, so this is the figure that we are saying that the if x is increasing then the, then the, then the readings that we obtain follow this curve while if x is decreasing they actually follow a distinctly different curve. So, if such behavior is demonstrated by an instrument it is called it is said to have hysteresis. So, next, so <coughs> now the errors that we have, you know, the, so, so we have actually typically an instrument is supposed to have a supposed to have a calibration curve, but the reading that it has may not exactly match with the calibration curve. It is it, it, if, you, if, you, if you read out an ammeter, then uh, it has some scale fixed, but if you send exactly 1 ampere current, then, then, the, then the needle may not stand at 1 ampere. So, this is the error. Now, the error is typically you know characterized as in into two different kinds. So, since the instrument is actually assumed to be a linear instrument, so it is assumed that the error can be of two types. The first type is called bias or offset, which is a constant error which is which is going to stay throughout the range. So, maybe at half at when you have a reading of when you have an actual current of 2 amperes your reading shows 2.5, when you have 3 amperes it shows 3.5, when you have 10 amperes it shows 10.5. So, you have a 0.5 ampere of bias right. If you see ammeters normal ammeters you will find that such biases can be corrected by you know screwdrivers. There, there are there are there, there, there are also sometimes called zero adjusts. Similarly, there can be there can be a gain error. So, so you have a sensitivity while we have a nominal sensitivity which is indicated by the scale and your actual instrument sensitivity may actually deviate from that and then you have a sensitivity or gain error and, and the error in reading due to this gain error is going to be proportional to the reading. So, if you have a, if you are measuring 10 degree centigrade then the error due to gain error is going to be half of if what you measure due to 20 degree when you when you measure 20 degree centigrade. So, we assume that the errors are of two kinds and these typically in typical sensors and instruments very often they can be corrected by electronic signal conditioning means. So, so that is what is depicted that if you have a 0 error so that is a bias and if you have a slope error that is that is the your gain error. Next is drift. So, sometimes what happens is that even if you correct even if you correct at any at some point of time during calibration even if you correct for the bias and the gain error you have drifts in the bias and the gain. So, so again such bias and gain errors can develop due to you know variations in temperature, variations in time or some other conditions. So, the rate at which it these will develop are are characterized by a performance characteristic called drift. <coughs> 